feedback from you guys about whether or not this would be a good thing to post on Moodle for future classes to be able to watch on their own. So um, we have Lee Manchester here. We get an email from Lee I know every that was day. Thing. So I didn't know that was a thing. So we are a person <laughs> sending you that email. Sometimes you just wonder if Lee Manchester is a real person and he is. Uh, but we are very excited, Dr. Disco tonight, to invite Matthew Kane today. Matt Kane graduated from Wagner College in 2015. He earned departmental honors in psychology, focusing on an honors thesis on African-American male student athletes academic success. So what predicted that? And, um, and you looked, you did some comparison of men who were and weren't athletes, men who identified as white, and men who identified as African-American. Um, we, in the psychology department, awarded him the Robert Nasipkis Memorial Prize for clinical psychology potential. And uh, that is a, a very prescient prize because he's, he's doing well with that. He is currently completing a master's degree in marriage and family therapy at Seton Hall University and applying for doctoral programs. As a graduate student right now, Matt works with student athletes for their academic success, participates on research teams regarding black couples and incarceration, and is the coordinator of two facilities including Community Education Center, where he, thera he works therapeutically with inmate populations and their families. So let's welcome Matt back to Wagner. Thank you, thank you. Can we get this uh, connected? Oh, yes, it's yeah. on the Does everybody have this uh, sheet in front of them? <coughs> the blank sheet in a way? All right. So what's up, y'all? How we doing? Good, good. good. A pleasure to be back here at, at my alma mater and to see you all. Things pretty much look the same. Uh, I just want to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, as Amy said, I did my undergrad here from 2011 to 2015. Uh, I was a student athlete here. I ran track. I was a jumper mainly. You really wouldn't see me on the track. I'm too out of shape. I can't run for that long. Um, how many people in here are athletes? Whew. Who is not an athlete? One, two, three, four. All right, what do you guys do? What do you do? I did football. You did play football? Okay, okay, how about you? I played soccer. You play soccer? Okay, it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be sports. What else do you guys do? How about you? You just play football? Okay, so we got everybody in the room either was an athlete or still is an athlete. So it's a pleasure to be talking to you guys and I feel like I can relate to you heavily. Um, today's topic is going to be working through failure and striving for success. So I'm not sure if Amy uh, briefed you guys on me coming out here, but this is actually the first time I've ever given a presentation like this, you know what I mean? So I'm a little nervous, so be easy on me. Be easy on me, all right? So while we get into things, I'd like for my presentations to not be just lecture, but more dialogue as well. So I'm definitely gonna be asking you guys to participate. So if you hate participating, I might be the person to call on you, I'm sorry. But we got three goals for today. Can somebody read that first goal for me? Read that. Oh, you can't say Is that good? Is it good for you, bro? Awesome. Can somebody read that first one for me? Identify how fear and failure are factualized. Awesome, thank you. Somebody read number two? You can just read it. Absolutely. And number three? Absolutely, so let's focus on items two and three. Notice how they say motivate you. I don't believe that I can come in here and tell you guys how to work out a failure. I don't believe that I can tell you what the standard of success is. I believe that I can only motivate you to develop your own standard for success. And that's gonna be what uh, our objective is for today, okay? So, if everybody doesn't mind, if you could flip over that piece of paper in front of you, I like to do group work as well, so if you're sitting alone, feel free to pair up with somebody. If you're sitting with somebody else, I want you guys to talk about, just for a couple minutes, what is failure? It can be the last time you failed, or it can be the feeling that comes up when you feel like you're about to fail. What is failure? All right, all right guys. So what do we got, what do we got? Anybody wanna share? Let me take my big hand back. Failure is not attempting. Failure is not attempting. Mm, I like that. What's up? I said um, failure is when you let the fear of failing stop you from attempting. 
Failure is when you let the fear of failure stop you from attempting. That's deep. What's up? Failure is letting someone down. What? Letting someone down and it could be yourself or letting someone else down. Okay. Anybody else want to share? What's up? It could be a lesson. Failure can be a lesson. Okay. Okay. Definitely. So if you if you don't succeed, it doesn't mean like it, it doesn't mean the end of the day. It means you might have actually gained something from it. You might have actually taken something away. All right. All right. You want to say something else? Yeah. Failure is giving up. Failure is giving up. What did you guys have? Failure is not achieving your goal. Failure is not achieving your goal. Wait, listen up, listen up, listen up. Failure is the belief that obstacles are a wall with no door. Can you say that again? Failure is the belief that obstacles are a wall with no door. Mm. So failure is to believe that whatever's in your way, there's no way around. That this is something you can't overcome. Good definitions, y'all. I like these. I like these. So. When I first got the email from Amy to come and talk to you guys, I remember I was sitting in my room, I was playing video games, and I haven't talked to Amy in a while, and I get an email, and I'm like, oh, what's this? I'm scrolling through, and it says, uh, oh, would you like to come and give a guest? Nope. Put my phone down. I said, what? Hell no. I'm not going to come out here and talk to you guys. I was confused, right? Like, how many of y'all ever heard of me before? Right? My name's not in the book. It's not in lights. I'm nobody special. Why me? Why do I have to come out here and talk to these people? So I said no. And I told myself every story. But the reality of it was I would love to come out and talk to you guys. I actually, like Amy said, I actually work with inmates. And I do groups with convicts, over 100 inmates in a room. And you know what we do? We talk about feelings. And you know what? I love it. And I would have loved to come in here to talk to you guys. But I was afraid. I was terrified. I gotta talk to freshmen? What if they throw tomatoes at me or something? Man, I don't, I don't know, I'm old now, right? But I had to own up to that, that I was afraid. And once I said that, I emailed her back. I don't remember if you remember, but I was like, you know what, Amy, I'm terrified. I'll do it. Because for me, that's what I had to develop to understand that I can succeed. Just because I'm afraid, it doesn't mean I can't do it. And you're gonna hear me say that a lot today. So I caught myself right before I failed and I sent her that email and said, you know what, I'm gonna do it. Because it's not, who am I to talk to you guys? But I'm the perfect person to talk to you guys. See, before I got to college, I was wildly under-successful academically. So when you ask, people used to think I look like Will Smith, so I like to throw that in there. <laughs> so when you ask, you know, who am I? I'm that guy. I'm that guy who minimized academics my whole life, from kindergarten throughout all of high school. I told myself, you know what? I don't need this. I told myself, this is stupid. I don't belong here, what is it, man? And I maximized athletics, I was an athlete all my life. Soccer, basketball, football, track in college. I maximized that, I told myself I loved it, and I did. I told myself I was good at it, and I like to think I was pretty good at it. I told myself that, you know what, I belong here. This is what I should do, this is what I can do. And it wasn't until end of senior year of high school I got a reality check. You know what? I kind of like academics. I took my only honors class, it was psychology, and I loved it. And I kept asking myself, like, why have I not been trying for so many years? Why was I not pursuing this? Like, this is pretty awesome. And what's worse, everybody thought I was an idiot. And I didn't even peep until I was a senior in high school. The way people would talk to me, you know, it's almost like they had to speak to me a certain way because they knew that Matt needed help. Let him skate by. Matt needs this. And it took me a while to realize because I thought I was gaming the system. Oh, I'm going to go to the, the lower level classes because they're going to read the books to me. I ain't going to read that for myself. Why would I? Right? I'm dead serious. That's exactly what I would do. But I got that reality check. And once I did, I realized just like before I came here to talk to you guys, I was afraid to fail. I was afraid to put all of my effort into academics. Because what if I did and I, and I really dropped the ball? See, athletics, if I, if I worked hard, I did well. But academics, if I worked hard, I might not do so well. And I was a little worried about that. Who can tell me the difference between failing and being a failure? Anybody? What's up, bro? Uh, 
being a failure is giving up, okay. But whereas failing is a learning experience, okay. So here's the way I think about it, I like that. To say you failed, that's a strength. That's to be able to identify that at this point in time, I dropped the ball right here at this thing. I didn't do well on that test. I missed that block. I missed the shot. I didn't clear that bar. I identified that. I didn't, I didn't do that. I failed at that, right? But to be a failure, that's deeper, right? That's visceral. That's to say that no matter what I touch, I'm going to fail. It's not going to turn out well. And that's what I was afraid of when I did academics. I was afraid I was going to try really hard and it wasn't going to work out. So the doubts hit in. And I ran away from it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pursue this. Right. I gave in. And what are some of the reasons that people give in? What are some of the reasons that people give in? They're afraid. Huh? They're afraid. They're afraid. Yeah. OK. What else? Pride. Pride. You don't got to raise your hand. Just say it. What's, what's up? What else? It's too much work. I feel that. I'm sorry? They think, they're not good enough. they think they're not good enough. Absolutely. So what I did was I went online and I found the four top reasons that people usually give up. Number one, it's hard. And we said that. Number two, you got scared. Three, you got discouraged. Something got in your way, kind of like your example. Something got in your way, you thought you couldn't get away, you couldn't find your way around it, right? Or number four, you settled. You thought that, you know what, this is good. You might have wanted more, but you told yourself, nah, nah, we're good here. And whatever that reason is, whatever the reason is that you give up, because remember, I want you guys to be able to motivate yourselves. Whatever the reason was that you gave up, I want you to find your truth. When you're pursuing something that you know you want, ask yourself, why is it that I give up? give you all some time to read that. And it can be for any number of reasons. It can be like the quote says, maybe you weren't ready. You could be that person that maybe you came from a lot, right? And the bar set so high that you think that I might fail. I can't live up to this. Or maybe you come from nothing and you're afraid that you're always going to stay nothing. Or maybe you're the person that took shortcuts. And you took shortcuts all your life because you thought that if I didn't take a shortcut, I don't think I can make it the whole distance. All right. And I can identify with a lot of these things. Whatever that reason is, whatever that reason is, y'all, I want y'all to be able to own it. I want you to be able to own whatever you're putting in your own way, whatever's stopping you from being successful. And I'm going to tell you why. So the majority of this presentation is uh, motivational, if you can't tell by now. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about uh, some information. Anybody ever hear a social location? Anybody know what that is? You're not allowed to raise your hand. Nobody? Social location? Okay. See, social location, somebody read that for me? The groups people belong to because of their place or position in history and society. Absolutely. And that could be any number of these things. Right. And a lot of us can identify with this, right? See, we weren't born thinking that we had limits, that we can and can't do something. We're, we're kids, we just, we just do it, right? But at a point, we learn that, you know, this is something you can do, this is something you can't do. And for me, if you can't look at me now, when I was young, I was a young black man, and what messages do we send young black men? Oh, don't die on me now, y'all. What messages do we send our young black men? What messages does society send? So you, if right. you are aware of a stereotype, you are not stereotyped, right? right? But what awareness do you have of stereotypes? Got to be an athlete. That's one of the things that I picked up. And I believed it. I got to be an athlete. They told me that black people were stupid, right? Nobody actually came up to me and was just like, black people were stupid. But it's a hidden message, right? And you just pick up on it. So I got to be an athlete, either an athlete or a criminal, and I chose athlete, right? And I believed it. It's literally like society looked at you, and I know a lot of you guys can identify with this. They'll look at you, they'll reach into the bag, and they'll be like, here, take this. 
this is you. This is who you're going to be. And at a young age, a lot of times we don't have people to help us to know that this isn't who we have to be, right? We can be whatever we want. But we put on that role. We become that. And you can't blame us, right? Because we are young. Because we don't know any better. And for me, it was easy. I can name hundreds of examples. When I was in school, my teachers would let me slide with things, right? I wouldn't hand in work, and I'd get grades. I remember this one time, I was in a math class, and I would sit in the back of the math class all semester and just eat my lunch. And the teacher would come back. He'd be teaching. He'd come back, and he'd put his hand out. You know, I'd grease him up with a little food. Food, not money, you know what I mean? I did that all semester until the end of the semester, I had to take the final. And the first day of the final, it was a two-day final. First day of the final was uh, multiple choice. I put that multiple choice test in front of me. I was like, what is this? I ain't seen none of this before, right? So guess what I got on the, fi on, the, on the first day, the multiple choice? What did I get? 27. 27? 65. 65. Actually, you're on point. I got a D. I didn't get an F. I wasn't that bad. I wasn't that bad. We got credit for work, thankfully. But I got a D, right? So this, the second day, that's open-ended response. So I'm like, oh my god, I got a D on the, the multiple choice? I don't stand a chance on the open-ended, right? I never got my grade back for the open-ended part. But the grade I got on that midterm, I'm sorry, not the midterm, on that final, was a B. I'm not too good at math, but I don't think that's how things work. And a lot of people think that's an advantage. You're an athlete. They're giving you an advantage. No. They let me slide all my life, and when I got older, I wasn't prepared for different things. My SAT scores, terrible. I'd never seen the majority of that material in my life. My GRE scores, even worse. Because when I'm studying for that to go to grad school, right, it's not things that you learn in college. It's usually things you learned in high school. So people are relearning it, right? Reminding themselves. I had to learn it for the first time. It's like we're determined. Not everybody, but a lot of times when we, when we put on that role society gives us, it's like we're determined to work hard as hell at becoming who they want us to be. But we tell ourselves that's who we want to be. Right. I see a couple head nods. OK. But I want you to be able to identify that, because I want you to be able to take back the control. Right. Take it back. For so long, they told us who we can and can't be. I want you to take it back, because they're not here to tell your story. You're here to author your own story. For me, I didn't like the fact that they thought I was an idiot. Right. So I stopped listening. I got fed up. The pain of their insults, the rage that I got from their judgments, and the worst part, the frustration that I had in myself that I believed them, that I couldn't do it. So I say to you guys now, because you're all freshmen, right? Everybody's a freshman in here? A couple weeks into the semester. I had the motivation to change, but you know what? I only had one role. That's all I knew how to do, right? So how am I going to become anything else? I don't know nothing else. You guys are in a great spot now in college. Reach out to your professors. Reach out to whomever and pick up a mentor. Professor Groth, he actually works over in the psych department. When I first come here, I didn't know what to do. But you know what? He kind of helped me to be me. You know, he didn't give me a role. But he helped me to, be, to, to succeed academically. So I suggest that you all try to find one mentor, two, or multiple, whatever you need to help yourself grow. So what do we do next, y'all? If we're that person who knows we want to change, whatever it is, it doesn't got to be academics. It can be athletics. It can be maybe you want to, to become an RA, or maybe you want to uh, get into the theater program, whatever it is. What do we do next? We know we want to work hard. We got people in our corner backing us up. What do we do? Huh? Absolutely. And the first step is to work. And when you work, you know what's going to happen? You won't fail. But you know what? <clears throat> Don't just work and fail. Work again. Fail again. Then work. And at a point, you're going to realize you're not just working and failing. Nah. You're persevering. You're continuing on in the same course of action. You're not giving up. And at a point, you're going to realize that you're not just persevering, but you're becoming relentless. Relentless. Over 50% of all freshman students, 
freshman students drop out within six years. And you're going to have to be relentless. Because I don't want to see any of that for any of you guys. For me, relentlessness looked like this. If we going into a test, me and you, and we boys, we in the same class, I'm going to kick your butt on that test. I'm coming for you. Right? We study together. But we got competitive with our academics as well. Not just athletics. I don't actually mean that, bro. <laughs> and after four years of doing that, of being relentless, I mean going to the library day in and day out. Library opened at 9 o'clock on weekends. Brunch didn't open until 11. I was a morning person. I was the first person in that library every week. That's what it took for me, because I knew I was behind the eight ball, right? So I got to get up. And in my four years here, I posted the highest GPA on my men's track team six out of eight semesters. I was named the 2014 NEC Scholar Athlete of the Year. I wrote two theses, one for departmental honors. I broke four collegiate records, and I was the first Seahawk to clear seven feet in the high jump. But the story's not about me, as much as I love to talk about myself. The story's about you guys, right? So I want to open it back up to you guys. We just talked about failure, right? But what is success? We don't got to talk in your groups, but we'll, let's uh, have a little dialogue. What is success to you guys? What's up, bro? Uh, learning, from your learning from your failures. Word, I like that. Achieving your goals. Okay, I want you to hold that for me. I want you to hold that for me. Achieving your goals. Fixing where you went wrong. Fixing where you went wrong. Okay. Anybody else? Um, identifying your mistakes. So in that moment, understanding like where you went right and where you went wrong, hashing them out. Word. I like that. <laughs> Anybody else? Let's get two more people. Let me get some I haven't heard from yet. Y'all a little quiet up front. Don't give me that face, bro. <laughs> money? OK. Making a lot of money, all right? All right, man. Happiness. Happiness. That's deep. That's deep. I like that. I had a buddy. I actually work with him now. He, he went to Rutgers, and he ran track there. <clears throat> His first semester, because the first semester of freshman year is a big one. It's a big one. It really defines a lot of what you want to do your next few years here. And when he went to, to Rutgers, he was a phenomenal student before college, but once he got there, he dropped the ball. First semester, I think he posted like a 2.3, something like that. And he made every excuse in the book, man, I'm homesick. I got a girlfriend back home, man. I'm sure we all got friends who say stuff like that, right? It wasn't until he could redefine what success meant for him, that he could refocus what he wanted to do. You see what I'm saying? So once you establish what you want to do, the question is, how bad do you want it? What are you going to sacrifice to do it? Are you going to get up and go to the library? Or when you're there for 30 minutes, are you going to pull your phone out and check out? Or are you going to stay for a couple extra hours? Anybody know what grit is? I like you. You like to participate. Huh? Absolutely, that's definitely a part of it. What's up, bro? Passive. Ooh. Okay. Absolutely. So <laughs> he on point. He on point. He got it from. Well, hey, it doesn't matter where you get it from. It's that you got it. You know what I'm saying? So grit is the trait of perseverance. It's what allows you to persevere, right? The passion and the motivation to pursue your long-term goal, whatever that long-term goal may be. That's what grit is. It's a phenomenal answer. So once we know what we want, and we know we're going to work for it, I don't want y'all to get scared now. Because next comes your fears, right? And we just talked about this in the beginning. You're going to realize that you're afraid to fail at a point. But I want you to embrace your fears. It's natural, right? Anybody ever hear of fight or flight? Fight or flight instinct? Right, right? Yeah. You, who ate? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I heard of it, yeah. What is it? Say I haven't it. heard from you yet, bro. Say it, say it. Okay. Okay, but he heard of it, right? Hold up. Absolutely, absolutely. We're not going to get too deep into the, into the psychology lesson, but absolutely. So our fight or flight is literally our body preparing itself for danger. So when you're scared, your body's actually ready. You know when you get the jitters? That's your body preparing itself. I'm either going to fight or I'm going to run away. That's your body ready. But now you got to get your mind ready, right? Because your body's ready to do whatever it takes. But if your mind's not on point, then you're not going to be able to do it. 
I'm gonna tell you a little story about me. Don't judge me for this. A lot of people on the track team never knew this. But when I was uh, a high jumper, I used to get terrible high jump anxiety. Terrible. Anybody know what high jump is? So when you're high jumping, they'd say, you know, so-and-so is up, Mike's up, Hams is on deck, Kane is in the hole. And when they said Kane was in the hole, I said, Ooh, that's me. I don't know if I'm ready. I would go to look at the bar. By senior year, my uh, starting height was like 6'8". I'm 5'10". So I'd go to look at the bar, I'd be like, you want me to run? You want me to jump that? I wasn't ready, so I would tell myself, I kid you not, I did this every time I jumped. Every single time I would high jump, I'd go to my step, and I'd say to myself, just what I said in the beginning, just because you're scared doesn't mean you can't do it. And I'd repeat that to myself. Just because you're scared doesn't mean you can't do it. Over and over until I finally went and jumped. And that's what helped me. I realized that I'm not a servant of my fear. That my fear works for me. And that's what helped me. How have you guys overcome fear before? Anybody? Hope I'm not asking for too much. What's up? I kind of go through the same thing growing because they have things to say about and stuff. Yeah. So whenever they would say, okay, Swiss knees in the hole, I had to go get my discus. I would just look at the discus, hold it, you know, practice with it a little bit. And then as when I am about to go in a circle, mm -hmm. I would look out at the discus I want to hit. And then I'd say, whatever it is that you're looking for, you have to believe to go above and beyond that discus. That's what's up. And I'd say, you've been practicing for this moment for I like that. I like that. It's not just athletics, though, right, guys? It can be academics, too. Do you got an academic example? No. I used to be afraid of heights. Where? Yeah. I was going to probably say it, but. But then what? I just went to the top of the Empire State, but looked over. For real? That's awesome, bro. That's awesome. Yeah. So these are the things it takes, right? It doesn't just have to be the athletic ability. It doesn't just have to be the athletic ability. So these are the things it takes, right? It doesn't just have to be athletics. It can be anything. Literally anything. So when you're in the library and you got that test coming up and you know you want to do well, but you're afraid that, you know, what if I study really hard and I still don't do well? You have to embrace that fear. You can't be afraid, or I'm sorry, you can be afraid to fail, but you can't let that fear stop you from doing what you know you have to do. So I wouldn't be fair if I asked you guys for what success means to you if I didn't tell you what it means to me. So this is my little definition of success. If anybody can't read it, it says, success is the perseverance through repeated failure. See, for me, I measure my successes by every time I get knocked down and I stand back up, that's a success. Or every time I see failure in the horizon and I don't stop, that's a success. And you said earlier that uh, success for you was reaching your goal, right? I kind of want to challenge you on that. Because I wonder, have you ever succeeded in something but didn't meet, reach your goal? Have you ever learned something? It didn't reach your goal, right? Well, you were successful then, weren't you? You might not reach your goal, but you succeeded. You learned something. I'm the kind of guy, if we're friends, and you go to take a test, you get your A, and you come to me, and it's like, yo, Kane, like, I did really good on the test. I got that A I always wanted. I didn't have to study for it. I'm going to be like, well, congrats, but why you sell yourself short, bro? If you knew you could have got it, why was that your goal in the first place, right? It's like that old school saying says, you should set a goal so big that you can't achieve it until you grow into the person that can. If you're setting a goal that you know you can already do, why is that even a goal for you? You already know you can do that. Make it bigger. Allow yourself to fail along the way. Every failure is a lesson. Every lesson is a growth. It's a success. And I just want to remind you too, just because you fail, just like we said in the beginning, just because you fail, it does not make you a failure. It makes you brave for trying. So I just want to give a little uh, shout out to Payne here, a little segue. So anybody know Ray Lewis? He's a controversial athlete, athlete definitely. But he's actually one of my favorites. So he's got a definition of pain. And he says that there's two sides to pain. If you ever go online, he's got a YouTube video. He's got a bunch of them. And he actually talks about this. He said there's two sides to pain. The first is the discomfort. 
It's the suffering. And we've all been there before something really painful happens to us and, and, and we, we can't focus on anything else. We don't want to focus on anything else. Maybe it makes us want to shrink, curl up into a ball. But he says that there's another side to pain, the effort. It's the willingness to work. You know, I'm not a religious man, but I'm very spiritual, and I believe that God would never put us through any type of pain without us coming out with a lesson. I believe he puts us through pain for us to learn from it. Pain is our greatest motivator. It'll either motivate you to do well or it can motivate you to stop entirely. I had an old coach who used to say, uh, you know what, Kane, I know you're scared. I know you feel pressure. But pressure does two things. What does pressure do? Either the bus pipes or it makes diamonds. Which one are you? Next, you got to ask yourself, if you're having trouble getting motivated, who sacrificed for you? Who took you to your games? Your friend's house? The library? Who helped get you where you are today in the seat that you're sitting in right now? And when you ask yourself that, a lot of people will be like, all right, word, so what are you going to sacrifice for them? Mm, nah. See, they sacrifice for you to be successful, right? So if they sacrifice for you to be successful, then you got to ask yourself, what am I going to sacrifice for myself? Because that's the greatest gift you can give them, is your success. Who sacrificed for you guys? Parents. Parents? OK. Siblings. Siblings, me too. Anybody else? Friends, maybe yourself? So when I was uh, finishing up this presentation, I was like, oh, I shot it to my friend. And they're like, oh, that's great. You're giving them a lot of motivation. But like, you ain't even tell them how you kind of did it. Like, what did you do to be successful? And this is going to be really silly, but I made my, my five tips to success. And number one actually came from my oldest brother. You saw in the picture before. He taught me that. And he said this the day before I went off to college. I was a freshman. And he said, uh, you know what, Few? He calls me Few. I want you to remember, if you want to be successful in college, he said, eat breakfast. Here he was, like he, he was just like me in high school, right? So he did poorly, and then he went to college, and he got like really successful. So I was sitting here looking up to my big brother, and I'm like, oh my god, what sagacious knowledge is he about to bestow on me? Like, I'm ready. He said, eat breakfast. <laughs> I was like, what? But I kid you not, man. I did this, and I still do this. Every day, I get up and I do something with my life. I get up and I eat my breakfast. Because at least you know you did something today. And now you got the energy to do something else. So I would get up at like 6 if I needed to before practice, get my breakfast and go to practice. Number two, this is actually a quote from uh, the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. You might have to humble yourself a little bit, you know. There's a lot of people around you that got a lot of information. I'm not saying sop it all up like a sponge, but be a filter. Be willing to take it in and see if it's for you or not. Number three, failure times repetition equals success. And that's what we just talked about this whole time. So don't be afraid to fail. Keep repeating. And the more you repeat it, the more successful you will be. Number four, check your circle. Anybody know what I mean by that? What do I mean by that? What's up, bro? Absolutely. So if you're looking to do great things, you better make sure you're surrounded by great people looking to do great things. Number five. This is actually something my other brother told me. I got two older brothers. He said, I was going through a rough time once, and I was like, yo, I keep, I keep letting everybody down, my teammates, my family, and everything. He's like, yo, yo check it. He's like, real quick, you got to have higher expectations of yourself than everybody else has of you. And I took that to heart, so I just wanted to share that with you guys. So as we finish up, I just wanted to say, one, thank you for your time. Two, I believe in you. If you want to be successful in all areas of your life, you definitely can be. Don't be afraid to give in to failure. It's like the uh, Samuel Beckett quote goes, ever try, ever fail, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better.
thank you for your time, guys. I don't know if you guys have questions or anything, but I'm willing to answer them. Oh, cool. So I think, I think you'd be happy to talk about grad school a little bit, if anybody had questions about that. Absolutely. Um, or ask, like, you were, you were a resident assistant on campus. I was. You talk about, about that. I was. Um, so, so I think people can feel pretty broad in, in any questions you want to ask. Yeah, ask me whatever. I'm pretty open. I'm a therapist. You can ask me whatever you want. Wait, so you, you are a therapist? Mm-hmm. So I work therapeutically with inmates. I do individual, couple, and family therapy with uh, the incarcerated population and also the groups. <clears throat> yep, so I majored in psychology. Me and Amy worked on a study together. I had uh, Jenkins, Nolan, Groth, Wagner, all of them. I'm not that old. Yeah. Two years ago. Yeah. So, so tell us just a little bit about grad school. Mm -hmm. So I go to Seton Hall now. I'm in their marriage and family therapy program. If you're interested, um, I can give you my contact information and we can talk about that. Uh, as for how quickly, I went right from my undergrad into my uh, master's program the first year. So marriage and family therapy there is three years. So it's super intensive. You're going to get a lot of work. Um, you're going to get a, a lot of material on how you want to do it. So if that's something you're interested in, it's a great program. Um, my first year, I was basically in classes. So I took four classes a semester. Um, who's interested in psychology or something like that? Or, love it, love it, great. Um, so my first year was just classes um, while I was looking for an internship. And they're going to give you a list of the different sites in the area. You can find your own. But they'll give you a list of different places that you can look. Um, and then right after that, I started my internship the following summer. So that was, I graduated in 2015, and I started my internship the summer of 2016. So that's when I started doing therapy. What do you think it's like? What do you think it's like? I don't know. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, fair. Absolutely. So I actually I do research in incarceration as well. Um, and we have this uh, stigma, and it's really an American one, about how inmates are. We think that they're, they're stupid, they're not humans. Um, we think less of them, right? It's actually an interesting fact. I think we account for like 3 or 5% of the world population. I forget. But we actually incarcerate 25% of all people. So 25% of all inmates come from the United States, even though we're only like 5% of the world population. It's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. But when I think about working with them, a lot of these guys are very intelligent, very bright. But like we talked about in the beginning when we were talking about social location, a lot of them were given this role, and they had nobody to show them any otherwise. I was actually born in Baltimore, Maryland, and I used to think about, you know, where would my life be if I stayed in Baltimore? Or if I didn't have somebody to show me any other way that, you know, you could be successful in something else. So working with the inmates, like, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that to get you to do it. <laughs> so the first time I ever worked with them, if you can imagine this, <clears throat> I go in and like my facility takes inmates out of the, the prison facility and they come um, to our rehabilitation facility. So there's not a lot of staff members at all, but there's a lot of inmates. And the very first thing I had to do was run a group about 25 of them in a loft, literally like from here back to about where uh, Lee is to like, yeah, the start of that table right there. And it's just me and like 25 inmates. Mm -hmm. just, and I'm like, yo, what if something happens? Right? So I got a little scared, but I found my way. Like, <laughs> they made me feel super welcome, honestly. And they were really into processing feelings. Like, I had no idea. I know the last name. I know the last name. She's she's 
got a PhD in counseling psychology now, and early on in her graduate school career, they would do group sessions with people who had been charged with drug offenses. Mm. So these people would be given an opportunity to go to group therapy instead of going to jail. And and one day in the group, there were two women in the group, and one was just getting on the other one's nerves, and, and she just ran across the group and attacked the other woman. And what was interesting is the, the men in the group surrounded the two therapists <coughs> to make sure that no yep. fists would be, you know, and, and she just, she said the, the, the impulse to protect her was really remarkable because yep. she wanted to get in and separate the two women mm-hmm. from each other because she was the authority figure in the room. And so it's, it's interesting that mm-hmm. bond between a therapist mm-hmm. and a person, you know, even if the person is very stigmatized. Absolutely. There's probably a bunch of guys in that room who would have had your back. Absolutely. Might have happened. But, Absolutely. But nothing did happen. Yep. Nothing. Nothing too crazy has happened um, to me. Right. I mean, <laughs> knock on wood, real quick. But yeah, nothing too crazy has has really happened to me. Um, a lot of these guys, you know, are good guys. We have to get past that stigma. Um, a lot of them just made one dumb mistake and can't find their can't find their way back. You know. So a lot of them just need help finding a new way to live their life. Do it. 40 huh? 40 second best hurdler in the country? Uh, we can talk track later if you want. I'm washed up now. You'll 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 destroy me. But yeah. Oh, okay. Did you know the pole vault just before you came here? Yeah. I said I knew I knew a couple of them. I knew a couple of them. That's what's up. I'm washed up now though. I can't. I can't do nothing. But uh, you said you're interested in becoming an RA, right? Yeah. Oh. I think I think you should do it. It's definitely worth it. Chris yeah. <laughs> Little insider information: when the tuition goes up, they usually tack it on room and board. So if you're an RA, it doesn't apply to you. Think about it. And plus, the job is actually really awesome. You get surrounded by a lot of is new it, people. Is it like a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job? Or? No. So when I was here, this was a couple years ago, so it was a different staff. But when I was here, you had to do a certain amount of duties, like weekday duties. And I think if you're in towers, you do like five to seven, like the semester. And then like one to two weekend duties, which is when you have the phone 24 hours on like a Saturday or a Sunday. But it's... It's not that difficult. Aside from that, you have like your meetings Monday nights. You got to put up a bulletin board, which like the people on your staff will help you make some door decorations and uh, run some programs. So you're a role model, but it's not yep. a ton of responsibility also. <clears throat> Absolutely. So you're definitely a role model. Every year I was here, I always had the athletes for. So I had the football guys a few times. Um, and then I had kind of a mosh pit of just everything, just an eclectic group of people. and. Um, I barely had to write anybody up. I could probably count on my hands the amount of times, and I was an RA for three years. I could probably count on my hands the amount of times I actually had to write people up. Yeah. What's up, bro? How did uh, being an RA like work with being an athlete? Um. Did like did you get to choose your own hours to work or Yeah, but it wasn't. So your schedule is going to be different than mine. For me, it, it honestly wasn't that difficult, and I was on the track team, like I was into my studies, I was an RA, I was on the advisory board of like two or three clubs, like it's possible, honestly, like, and I, and I still had my social life, so like it's really possible. A lot of people just make it out to be more than, than what it is, and for people like, not to be biased, but since I was an athlete all my life, I learned a lot about grit and time management and things like that, so uh, for people who are used to time management and just getting things done, like it's not gonna be that crazy for you, honestly. It'll be pretty simple. <coughs> Fall asleep. Any other questions? I'm being completely honest. I'm now in uh, my master's program, and I'm surrounded by a lot of people. Some of them didn't do their uh, undergrad in psychology, but they're still doing really well. But in terms of my own preparedness for a master's level, like. 
I've been in classes and I'm like, I already did this. And I don't mean just the first few weeks, I mean like the whole class. I'm like, yeah, I did this already. So Wagner's psychology program in particular <clears throat> is really on point. They're gonna have, you guys still have to do like three research things or something? The three, the three times you do research, if you're a psych major, remember all of them, put, their, put them in your resume or your CV immediately because research experience looks great. I still got a few of them in mind. So a, a lot of other programs don't actually have that, that research experience. And it separates you light years from people who don't have it. Yeah. Tips on reading peer-reviewed journal articles. Tips on reading peer-reviewed journal. Do you want me to be honest? Yeah. All right, so if I got a 20-page peer-reviewed journal article, you guys read those? Do they read these? They, they've been exposed. Been exposed? All right, so I will, if it's a topic I've never heard of, I'm going to read the first few articles in its entirety except for the results section because it doesn't make sense to anybody except Dr. Wagner and I have no idea what, what they're talking about. But the first few articles, because the abstract is going to tell you what this article is about, the lit review is going to tell you what everybody else has already started, that's what a literature review is, it's literally just a review of the literature on this topic. So you're going to get an idea of what everybody else has done. The results section, you're going to be like, I don't know what this means. Skip it. Go right to the discussion section, which tells you what the results section means. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. After that, I skip the lit reviews. I do the abstract. I do the discussion. And uh, if there's anything in between, I like to, to focus on that, too. But yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is, is it fair that we're pushing these guys to read peer-reviewed journal articles? Is it skills to develop? You're going to hate me, man. But absolutely. Absolutely. To understand how to break it down is going to separate you from everybody else who does not know how to do it. And when you're in grad school or when you're trying to, you're in the job and like people don't know actually how to outline articles and you're in here like this is cake, you're going you're gonna to be thanking Amy. You're going to be thanking Amy. So do what she says 100%. She will prepare you. Will I torture them sometimes? Yes. Yes. The amount of times she returned my thesis. I can't count. I can't count. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it was absolutely what I needed. So put you yourself through it. With me sometimes. Yeah, but I hit it. I think I hit it pretty well. You hit it very, very well. Very well, yeah. But I, I would be like, I didn't. Poor kid. Make him write this again. Oh, you know, we would go to the library and we'd be there for two hours. And she'd send me an email a few days later and be like, we know all the work we just did. Let's scrap it. We're going to start somewhere else. And I'm like, yeah. I agree. Let's scrap it. Let's scrap it. <laughs> so Matt put together a survey, and we spent a lot of time going through that survey trying to figure out what the survey could tell us. Absolutely. A lot of time sitting side by side yeah. looking at the data on the computer. But you know what, though? Looking at it now, like, doing stuff like that is so easy for me. Like, I, I'm actually working on a literature review now, that, that study she told you about black couples and incarceration. And I'm not worried about it at all, because I know exactly how to do a review. I know how to read my peer uh, <clears throat> review journals pretty easily. So it's just something that's got to get done now. And it's like we talked about before. You just got to work. You know what I mean? Do you think that's a good skill, even if they're going to go into business or something totally different? Reading peer review journals? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to expose you to different things. It's going to make you think differently. And it's going to give you a skill in the business world that you're going to need as well. My brother's actually, my two older brothers that you saw there, uh, Will majored in economics and finance and still did business marketing. They're both in sales now. But the trait, that, or not the traits, the skills that you guys are learning in this class are things that they still use in their jobs. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely.